Hello and welcome to Cooking with Hobbs. Just kidding, this is Political Philosophy with Hobbs. In the words of Hobbes from Leviathan, Whatsoever therefore is consequent to a time of war, where every man is enemy to every man. The same consequent to the time wherein men live without other security than what their own strength and their own inventions shall furnish them withal. In such condition there is no place for industry, because the fruit thereof is uncertain, and consequently no culture of the earth, no navigation, nor use for the commodities that may be imported by sea. No commodious buildings, no instruments of moving or removing such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. In part one, we're going to be looking at the life and historical context of Thomas Hobbes, in part two, we're looking at the state of nature. In part three, we're looking at the solution. And in part four, we're looking at further analyses and discussion. Hello, and welcome to episode 21 of the Pan Psychast on Thomas Hobbes's political philosophy. I'm Jack Symes, and I'm joined once again by Mr. Andrew Horton. Good day. And Mr. Ollie Marley as well. Good day. How do you both perspire? <laughs> no, not answering that question. I'm doing incredibly well, and I think there's something to be said. We hit 20 episodes last episode, and we made no deal of it, but actually... That's very impressive. It we was. uh we should make a bigger deal out of it. Obviously, twenty episodes is fantastic. We have reached the big two o. Even though I think if you break it down with all the episodes generally, we've probably nearly doubled or probably yeah, tripled 40, that by now. 50, something yeah, like that. So yeah. uh, I guess it's a really good opportunity to just say thank you for everybody that's listening. I mean, if people weren't listening to the podcast, we probably <laughs> wouldn't be making any episodes. So thank you very much for listening, and we hope that you like the direction that we're going in and you're enjoying the uh, the content that we're making for you. So today we're continuing our journey into political philosophy after beginning with Plato last episode. Highly recommend going back and listening to that episode because it introduces a lot of the themes we're going to be looking at today. Now Thomas Hobbes is perhaps the greatest political philosopher to have ever lived in many people's eyes. And why? Well, we're going to find out this episode. Part 1. Life and Historical Context Our inquiry question, what in the life was Thomas Hobbes's life like in context? Thomas Hobbes was born in 1588 prematurely. Now there's quite a funny story behind this because his mother actually apparently heard news that the Spanish Armada was attacking and had a premature birth and Hobbes is quoted as saying, fear and I are born twins. Hobbes is seen as the founder of English political and moral philosophy, and he saw himself as the first political scientist, mainly because his theories did not rely on historical comparison. He is often referred to as the first modern materialist. His most famous work, The Leviathan, makes bold claims about human nature and how we should be governed. So who was Thomas Hobbes? Well, he lived in Elizabethan England, and in many respects he was the product of his time. Interestingly, he lived till the age of 91, born in 1588, dying in 1679. The average age of a person of around that time, a male, was 33 years old. So he nearly surpassed that by 60 years. And he did most of his work past the age of 60, so he should have been dead for 27 years when he actually came to writing <laughs> these ideas down. Uh, coming from North Wiltshire and dying in Derbyshire, he's one of the greatest English writers to have ever lived. So what do we know about Hobbes, his life? Well, like many people, he well, many of the philosophers anyway that we've been talking about. He went to a very 
important university, Oxford University. Uh, however, Oxford didn't really much like Hobbes. Uh, they destroyed a lot of the work he did after he left. Um, he was quite a controversial figure and didn't pull any punches. He, he wrote scathing reviews of other philosophers, including Descartes, who we will perhaps touch upon in a minute. Um, but because of that, people also criticized his work. Plenty of people had lots of things to say about his political philosophy. So his parents weren't very well off, and although you say he went to Oxford University, Andy, obviously his, uh, his mother was in the cloth trade, and his father had a falling out and after slandering another cleric. So a cleric from another church, he said something negative about him, and then he was excommunicated by the church, Hobbes' father. He then bumps into the cleric, which he slandered, outside of a church on the steps of the church and they ended up in like a fist fight Hobbes's father left him after the age of four after being shamed by the whole incident so he had to flee and then his uncle took the place of his father essentially and his uncle was very well off and was able to send him to these fancy schools and have a good ed education which he wouldn't have had without his uncle's help yeah and uh i think Hobbes Hobbes's life is he gets quite a fortunate roll of the dice after he leaves the university. So he was asked to become the tutor for the, the son of the Earl of Devonshire, uh, and he became part of the Cavendish family for the rest of his life. Um, and that meant that he obviously could focus on his writings without having to worry about much else. And, and what's unique about this is because he was so young, uh, the, the son of the Earl of Devonshire specifically requested that he didn't want an elderly old McCudgeon d doing his tutoring. He wanted someone of his own age that could kind of be a contemporary to him. And Hobbes was obviously a very bright student at Oxford and was selected on that basis. He was only two years older than him, wasn't he? Only two years older Hobbes than the person he was, his tutee. So Hobbes lives at a very interesting time just in history, generally in Europe. He actually had the opportunity to meet many other influential people, some of which we have discussed already. So he was quite buddy with René Descartes. Mm -hmm. This is a fact. They often... Did they meet? So he, he so he went to Paris uh, at some point in his life where he met Galileo and Descartes, yeah, after leaving for that. So that's a very... Um, obviously, you can imagine those three people very intelligent um, and completely reshaping the scientific and philosophical world. That must have been quite a, quite a meeting between the three of them. Interestingly, on the point of Descartes and Galileo, as we're going to pick up on throughout this episode... Hobbes was a materialist, and although he thought that Descartes had a lot of things right, what he thought he had wrong was the substance dualism aspects, the Cartesian dualism. Listen to our episode 3 and episode 19 on what that is. But Descartes essentially thought we had a soul. Now the rest of Descartes' philosophy seems to embody a very mechanistic understanding of the world. We've mentioned this before, Descartes thought that all animals and all physical things ran mechanistically, i.e. they weren't guided towards some telos, I, they were just material things, but uniquely to humans, they have souls. Now, Hobbes goes one step further and says humans don't have souls in the non-physical sense. He thinks everything is material and physical. So at the time, you'd be dumb. It's blasphemy if you say something like this, right? It's you're an atheist. Now, there's being an atheist like Richard Dawkins and people like this who stand up and say there is no God, and there's being an atheist by consequence. So you're an atheist by consequence if you deny the true definition of God. Now, obviously, at the time, any church in the West is going to say that God is an immaterial being. But in a Latin translation of the Leviathan, Hobbes actually says that God is a material being. Because if God is everywhere, he must be material to walk around in him. He also thought angels were material and stuff like this. So he was an atheist by consequence. So in 1666, the English Parliament cited him as an atheist as the cause of the plague and the fire of London. And in 1683, his books were publicly burnt in Oxford, as you were saying, Andy. If you were influenced by Hobbes, you just didn't say so. To be a Hobbesian was to be a very negative thing at the time. In the same way, you could be a Darwinian or an Orwellian. To be a Hobbesian was seen as a negative thing at the time. You don't want to be that. But to say Hobbes was a, a nasty person or someone who was Hobbesian himself... Is this a mischaracterization of a man which, is he a good person? Is he, is he embody his theory in his personality? Yeah, the, the interesting thing is when most people see Hobbes or Leviathan on the surface, it paints this very bleak picture of human nature. But actually, it's not necessarily human nature to cause all of these problems. It's the, the state of nature which causes people to act inherently selfishly. Um, no, in, in, in a regular well-run state, 
Hobbes believes that people will be able to live peacefully and get the best out of everything. And Hobbes himself uh, is supposed to have been quite a jovial figure. He liked a, a good joke and uh, he impressed people quite a lot with his wit. So he, he obviously was in good good stead in that regard. And going back to the atheism point, just to make it really, really clear, Hobbes wasn't the kind of person that would stand up like Richard Dawkins and say, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. He wanted to explain God. And at that time, that wasn't something you did. And if you said anything or wrote anything which directly contradicted the church teachings about God, then you would have been heavily criticized for it, just like Hobbes was. He wants to explain God. He wants to explain the afterlife. He wants to explain angels and all of the miracles and other religious doctrines materially. That's what he wants to do. That was kind of his goal. So it's a bit of a, a mistake, really, to say that he is an atheist in the traditional sense, the modern sense that we use today. He wasn't. He was someone who did believe in God. Now, whether that was because he had to and he didn't really have a choice may be up for discussion, but in his writing, he never accurately, specifically says, I am an atheist. These things don't exist. He tries to explain them materially. Now, obviously, we know that you can't do that, that so far, as much as we know, you can't materially explain the existence of God or angels or the afterlife. And that's kind of the conclusion that a lot of people came to reading his work and hence why his work was so controversial. Okay, I'm just going to quote from Maggie here to help us understand the context of when Hobbes lived. So Hobbes lived from Elizabeth I's reign well into the reign of Charles II, during which time England faced the many challenges caused by the Reformation and the Civil War. The conflict between King Charles I and his royalist supporters and Parliament, known as the English Civil War, ended with a parliamentary victory. The success of the parliamentary forces led to the king's execution in 1649. The exile of his heir, Charles II, and the establishment of a commonwealth under Oliver Cromwell. And within Thomas Hobbes's lifetime, Charles II was uh, put back into place as the king. Now, this is a really interesting political time for England. Obviously, a civil war, for those that are unsure, is a war when a country is at war with itself. And there was a big fight within England about who should be in control, who should have power. Should it be the king or should it be the people? And this was a, a very serious conflict that led to the execution of Charles I, uh, the king. And then eventually the re-establishment of the monarchy with Charles II. And you can see that in Hobbes' writing, he really likes the idea of the stability of a king. Um, we'll talk about the actual monarchy detail in a bit more detail later on, but he likes the idea of this authority and this power coming from one single source. And that he saw directly through his own experiences the impact of removing that king had. Um, you know, the Civil War led to, you know, the deaths of thousands of people and complete political upheaval and obviously that drastically influences writing if he hadn't have witnessed those things it's probably unlikely leviathan would probably exist i would argue yeah he he actually wrote leviathan uh, while he was in france so he'd he'd, he'd fled uh, the uk because of well fear of his own life and that uh, some people argue that he he wrote it as a way to appease uh, or promote a sort of pro-monarchy view uh, for a safe uh, sort of entry back to England uh, when Charles II took the throne. If you read any of the Leviathan and links to it are on the website, you'll see just how analytic and scientific his writing is and how he embodies that with a level of wit and understanding of the contemporary society that he lives in. He has a fantastic quote again, which I, I really love this. Hobbes says, if he had read as much as other men he should have known no more than other men the idea being that Hobbes read so much but what did he know outside of that well thinking was the most important thing to him he thought that you can read as much as you like but it's the think it's what you do with what you read is what you are uh, is what you learn and can apply to the world Part 2. The State of Nature Our inquiry question, what is Hobbes' understanding of human nature and what is the state of nature and how is human nature applied in the state of nature? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> right, we start off with the first one. Uh, human nature. So Hobbes' mechanistic philosophy, his materialist philosophy, is fundamental to everything that's going to come afterwards. So what is his materialist philosophy? Good question. He like Descartes, has a similar view to the idea that everything in the external reality seems to be uh, a mechanism. 
the thing is, is that he has a fundamental difference with Descartes about this idea of, like, can we actually know anything? And if you think back to the Descartes episode that we did, what does, what's Descartes' skepticism? Why has he got a problem with knowing anything about the external world? Because, Andrew, your senses are unreliable, because sometimes they deceive you and lie to you. There may be a small demon between your eyes and your brain, corrupting things. Your, your senses are unreliable. Okay, right. What Hobbes, Hobbes has a somewhat similar view, but gets around some of the issues there, and therefore, while he is is a skeptic, he he allows for a bit more knowledge of what is actually physically there, and his whole idea is completely surrounded by this notion of that the only things that really exist are what he calls bodies in motion, and motion is really important. The fact is, is that we don't see a static image in front of us that is always there. It's constantly changing, constantly moving. And he says that things can only move, and we've talked about this before, things can only be moved if what if something moves them. Mm-hmm. And therefore, something, an object will have to move that one and so forth. What does that mean? Well, it, it goes back to that idea of sufficient reason again from Leibniz or, or you know, the first cause argument. And you can actually see that ties into his whole view of God as well. God is only there as an answer to the first cause as this physical material mechanism other than that you can't say anything about uh, anything else so there are only bodies and anything that can or anything that moves has to be moved by something else Hobbes therefore seems to think that well even our- ourselves even within our mind we're just experiencing we're seeing all of these motions and that has an effect on within our brain which is therefore affected by that what does that actually mean for human beings? Well, it says something about determinism somewhat in that like we are only completely controlled by what the outside experiences are affecting on us. Um, but it also says a lot about what we can actually know about things that aren't physical, uh, which is really important to how he views ethics. So on the point of determinism, so this is really important before we get into the state of nature. He's taking this mechanistic, materialist understanding of the world to the extreme. If everything is material, the cognitive functions in your brain function in the same way as billiard balls on a billiard table, right? As dominoes falling around. The dominoes that falls is caused by the dominoes that came before it. So Carl Determinist will say that no decision that you make is free. Everything you do is caused by something physical. Hobbes accepts mechanistic philosophy and he accepts a hard materialist universe in his ontology and he has no non-physical things in his ontology but he seems to be a compatibilist he thinks we have free will but everything is material and how does he do that well he defines freedom as liberty or freedom that signifies the absence of opposition i.e not hindered to do what he wants to do quoting from Hobbes there. So as long as I can do what I want to do, that means I'm free. And we've touched on this in Philosophy of Religion episodes when we're looking at freedom. If I want to leave this room now, as long as I can do that, I am free. Whether I'm causally determined by my desire to go and grab a coffee or something like this, as long as I'm choosing to leave the room, that means I'm free. So although he accepts a mechanistic materialist universe, we still have freedom for it. Yeah, and the... um why this is really important, I know it seems weird that we're talking about political philosophy, yet we're, we're now suddenly uh, spoken so much on this idea of materialism. It's because it's what this means for anything outside of what is actually physical. So if you take anything like colours, why is that a problem for Hobbes? What is the colour orange to Hobbes? What could that be? So I'll give the example of a na- naive realist metaphysical view of the universe. So a naive realist, they see orange, they see an orange, which is the colour orange, and I think the colour orange is actually out there in the world, right? But Hobbes doesn't think it's out there in the world. They den- He denies the objectivity of, of the colour orange. In a sense, he says, it's the subjective experience and the interaction of myself with the external world that gives rise to the colour orange. I think he's he's sort of an indirect realist, if, if, although he's not going to appeal to that metaphysical view. There's an intermediary, there's a subjective um, subjective lens that it goes through. Yeah, it's matter in motion, isn't it? And just to clarify, a materialist is someone who believes that matter is all there is. Unlike Descartes, who believed that there was physical matter and unphysical substances that our minds are made out of, etc. Hobbes would disagree with that completely. He'd say, no, it's just matter in motion. Your mind, colour, all of it is simply just matter in motion. Well, they, yeah, that's that's the interesting thing. So if you take something like colour, I mean, that seems quite trivial, but what Hobbes is saying is is that 
my experience of the color orange is entirely subjective to my own mechanism. I have my interpretation of what that color actually is, but the the orange fruit that I'm looking at is not actually orange. That's a secondary property of what that orange actually is. Galileo set up this whole way of looking at science prioritizing the fact that we should only really be examining the primary properties of something you know what is it it's physical terms something that we can actually quantify not something that is simply subjective right so let me let me give a quick example so this table in front of us now or whatever listeners look at an object in front of you it might be your phone might be a chair or something like this so it's got primary properties objective properties that are the same for all of us like its shape and size secondary properties Things that have to go through your sensory organs and nervous system. So when me, Andy and Ollie look at the table in front of us, we, sh we share the same idea of its shape and size, but we differ on the secondary qualities of it because it has to go through our different sensory organs. So hence why you say to a colorblind person, that's blue, and they go, no, that's, that's golden orange or something like that. That's beige or something like this. Well, that's because it's a secondary property and we have a differing opinion when it goes through our sensory organs. This links nicely in with these ethics, though, doesn't it? So it's all about this idea of subjectivity. Beauty, subjective, colour is subjective, and so on. And what that obviously means for ethics is that we can't objectively say if something is actually wrong or if it's actually right. We talked about the idea of emotivism when we were looking at, I think, utilitarianism, that morality is just us simply saying, I disagree, or I agree with this. This makes me feel good. This doesn't make me feel good. Mm -hmm. And if that's actually the case, then there is no way that you can have a society all agree up agreeing upon the same things to say, oh yes, we should definitely raise taxes to, to help pay for the benefits for people. Because there might be some people who just say, no, I think that's immoral. You're kind of lost in this sort of shouting about emotion which doesn't get us anywhere well he starts off he doesn't quite go as far as emotivism does he but he says there is no such thing as objective moral truths he actually analyzes moses bringing the commandments down the mountain and says you know who was this man and so on because he's denying objective moral truths you can see again how he follows the charge of atheists by consequent here's a quote from hobbes which embodies his subjective view of morals Every man, for his own part, calleth with which pleasureth, and delightful to himself, good, and that evil, which displeth him. Insomuch that while every man differeth from another in constitution, they differ also one from another concerning the common distinction of good and evil. Emphasize that last part again. They differ also from one another concerning the common distinction of good and evil. This is always different from Ollie to Jack to Jack to Andy morals are always going to be different we might agree on some do not murder for example in most contexts we're all going to agree when we it goes through our sensory organs and we make a decision on whether that's good or bad but lots of things we do disagree on morally and we found that out in all our ethics episodes haven't we yeah. Yeah. and Hobbes would say that essentially what what you think is moral is just what benefits you like if you're Really, it's about self-interest. If you want to look after yourself, then what you think is moral is really kind of, how can I get something out of this? I want can to benefit other people, of course. Hobbes thought that man had three elements of his fundamental nature. And I'll quote from him here. So that in the nature of man, we find three principal causes of quarrel. First, competition. Secondly, dissidence. And thirdly, glory. The first maketh man invade for gain, the second for safety, and the third for reputation. The first use violence to make themselves masters of other men's persons, wives, children, and cattle. The second to defend themselves, the third for trifles as a word, a smile, a different opinion, and any other sign of undervalue, either direct in their persons or by reflection in their kindred, their friends, their nation, their profession, or their name. So three parts of the nature of man, competition, diffidence and glory but these are the things that hobbes believes about human nature that would cause conflict um i won't spend long on this because we'll get into the state of nature in just a second but he also thinks just similar to plato actually that human beings have three other qualities which are sense passion and reason um and sense is kind of well 
like you being able to see, smell, and, and hear, and all of that stuff. Uh, passion, more to do with the emotion and desire, and reason, obviously, being able to calculate for Hobbes. But that's what his definition of reason really is, being able to calculate consequences, um, which is hugely important uh, for being able to determine how to get out of the state of nature. Desire and pride are the biggest flaws that Hobbes thinks that we have. Those are the things that cause us all sorts of problems if we do not have somebody to tell us what to do. What is Hobbes' state of nature? Imagine that you are sat at home right now and then the TV turns on unexplainedly and a politician is stood at the TV and he says, there are no rules anymore. I step down. No government will ever be in place again. You're all out for yourselves. Good luck. <laughs> That's good. That's a good characterization. Yeah, what, what are we going to do in this situation? So ev everything, all laws, no police uh, around anymore, no military. There's nothing stopping or holding any sort of objective morality in place. How are we all going to react? Yeah, so a state of nature pretty much is no society. Is there? All the societal structures are gone. How are people going to react? Now, I am going to say that people at the start might be, like, okay, maybe we can make the most of this. But I think quite quickly it would turn into people being very selfish and looking after them and their own and would see everyone else as competition for this. I mean, you can look at lots of different media for examples of this. Um, a really popular example and one that I'm going to explain is The Lord of the Flies. So in Lord of the Flies by William Golding, several school children are stranded on a desert island and they have to form a society on this island and it's very similar to the state of nature and in this story Golding explores the idea that at kind of humanity's core we are selfish and we are tribal and we do hurt each other and we are violent um, and I think that perfectly kind of sums up the, the state of nature really for Hobbes he thinks that if people have no laws, have no society, have no authority to tell them what to do, then ultimately their human nature takes hold and that they will behave selfishly to look after themselves. I think importantly, although we've explained the thought experiment quite nicely and quite uniquely in Andy's terms, what Hobbes is getting at is here this is a time prior to society or the state. So before we have a state or a society, this is what things hypothetically would be like not historically and he does allude to the fact that some tribes in america might have been in the state of nature but that's besides the point it's all hypothetical here so before we set up a government or a state what would life be like that's his question and ollie you've answered that question perfectly i think it would be very much like lord of the flies so in the introduction to this episode i gave the quote which is hobbes's characterization of the state of nature which concluded with the life of man being solitary poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And this is the most famous quotation by Hobbes. And why? Because this encapsulates the state of nature. We're in a state of war of all against all. Now, it's not the traditional idea we have of war today, where Ollie's army attacks Andy's army and they both have a group of people defending them. It's everyone out for themselves. That's human nature. And Hobbes has got quite a pessimistic view of human nature and he's been criticised a lot by epistemologists and people who have came after him, and even people at his time. But if we're in the state of nature and human beings are ultimately selfish and fulfill their own selfish goals, then we will be in the state of all against all. This isn't to say as soon as the politician comes on TV, I run to my neighbour's house, rob him blind and kill him and take all his belongings. It's not like that. This isn't a state of nature of war as we know it. If you're in a state of nature and imagine it for a second, you're going to be suspicious of everybody. There's no law that governs that person not to kill you. And Hobbes thinks everyone has a right to defend themselves, right? And this is something we'll touch on in a second. But if everyone's out for themselves, who can you trust? Nobody. There's no law. What's to say that you can't go and kill that person if you think they're looking at you funny or something like this? Imagine walking down the street, look at all the people around you if you've got headphones in. If there were no laws, no government, any of these people could kill you at any moment. It's a horrifying idea. If there was no authority, if there was no state, would I be able to survive? Could I look after myself? Could I look after my friends or my family? Would I be the kind of person that could do something really morally wrong to survive? Because Hobbes is going to say that there is no objective morality. There's no objective morality at all. You could do whatever you want. If someone looks at you funny, cut their head off. 
Immanuel Kant and Nozick, people who we're going to look at in the future. If you're a political writer, this is why Hobbes is so influential. If you write anything in political philosophy, you need na knowledge of the state of nature. And for different people, the state of nature embodies different things. I won't go on a side quest to, to Kant, but Kant thought that we all have an inherent moral code if we think about it enough. So the state of nature wasn't one of the same characterization as Hobbes gives, he thinks ultimately the state of nature is one of injustice. So we want to leave the state of nature to be ethical or to promote the safety and protection of autonomy. Yeah, but plenty of people who've written stuff about social contract have all, all had their own views. So Rousseau and uh, Locke also have their own concept of the state of nature. To just tie it back into sort of why the state of nature is uh, such a big problem, um, and we've we've alluded to it before, which is that Hobbes thinks that there's only one natural right that people actually have, and it's self-preservation. And this is hardwired into us for Hobbes. Uh, human beings will do anything they can do to to stay alive, no matter what. To the point where, even once we get to the point where we have this sovereign, you still have the right to defend your life if you are going to be taken to the guillotine to be killed. Um, so that that holds. That's really, really powerful within human beings. But because of that. And Jack mentioned the idea of these three causes of conflict within the state of nature, and one of them being this mutual fear. If you're constantly worried about your own self-preservation, then this lack of trust is, is, is prevalent everywhere. You could never trust anybody. Even the strong and powerful people would have to fear about going to sleep because then the weak would have their chance to kill them. And he would say that it would be entirely logical to kill someone because you would always want to preempt this, the strike. You don't want to be the person who is caught out getting stabbed in the back. If you kill them first, then you're safe. It's always going back to that. You need to make sure that your safety is prioritized. And because of that, you're, you're constantly worried about everybody else killing people and, and or hoarding tons of stuff so nobody else could have it is all self beneficial for you uh, and the, that's that's what everyone's going to strive to end up doing yeah and this creates tension doesn't it so for example there's uh, talk philosophically about the difference between animals and humans when it comes to a state of nature now animals live in a state of nature all the time for example ant colonies fulfill their role to preserve their their queen and their, their society I guess in inverted commas you could say but they don't have the same tension that human beings do. They don't have a conflict of interest. They're, they're programmed or mechanistic in the fact that they're trying to keep the hive alive. So unlike ants or animals, Hobbes is going to say that we're selfish. This tension is going to cause us to be suspicious of each other and potentially harm each other. Um, and he thinks this is inevitable if people revert back to a state of nature. Hobbes' idea of power is pretty important to the state of nature. It sure is. The idea of power for Hobbes is all about having control over future consequences. So when he's talking power, that's really what he's saying. And you can imagine how important this would be for the state of nature, having control over future consequences. So having power could be having control over the food source, knowing that you know where your next meal is going to come. Again, you're, you're very concerned with your own preservation, so having lots of food is a good thing. It also might mean that you have, more importantly, control over all other people. Because if you have that control over other people, then that means that you know you're not going to be killed by others. And that might mean, as a worse result, killing everybody you come across so that they will never be able to harm you. That would be the ultimate control of, their, of the consequences they could bring about onto you. He thinks that this will run prevalent throughout the entire of the state of nature and probably even worse is the idea of um, vain glory that uh, again jack talked about earlier which is that is that's essentially is pride that even when peace is seem seemingly offered to some people that they will their pride of having all of these things that they've acquired in the state of nature might cause them to just be randomly violent anyway it's kind of this really illogical part of the human being which would just keep them constantly in that negative state andy you mentioned earlier that everyone has a right to self-preservation essentially what is Hobbes' view on natural rights and laws? This is something that he fleshes out in the Leviathan. Yeah, the, well, the only natural right that you actually have is, as you said, self-preservation. Hobbes' view of natural law is very different to what we've talked about before. We've obviously said that natural law to a lot of these classical thinkers was uh, like reason's way of tapping into either God's eternal law, or maybe for Aristotle it's... Uh, 
finding out what our telos is in reflection of the prime mover but hobbes has already established that there are only material things so that can't possibly be the case for him he's not teleological he says something quite funny about teleology at one point doesn't he about um you can pull your teleology in any direction you like you can say humans are made to eat lions but then you could say lions are made to eat humans so you can do that in any direction you like and he really rejects this idea hard to get the aristotelian idea at the time yeah he certainly he really wasn't a, a fan of aristotle for that matter in most things he thought that people focused too heavily on him and that was actually preventing them from making progress the idea then for him for natural law is simply things that reason would dictate would help us create peace because for him that is the kind of the most important thing it, if you can establish peace a peaceful society then that's all you can really hope for um so can well can you guys before i give anything think of any natural laws that you could dictate through reason if you were trying to promote safety what sort of things could you would you want i guess well i would say that from hobbes's point of view he's probably looking at anything is better than nothing so the idea that surely this state of nature should be avoided at all costs even if it has to be something slightly authoritarian or totalitarian that's far better than having a complete state of chaos okay um yep that was basically it and and i'm just going to read a couple of examples here he actually he deduces 19 commands but we're not going to go through all of them yeah, um, we should go let's go through all of them one by one no <laughs> number funny. one um so the main ones are simply seek peace so wherever there's possible to seek peace you should do lay down the right to all things and transfer power to a sovereign that's going to be very important to what we're coming on to next obey the social contract promote the attitudes conductive to civil peace such as gratitude forgiveness avoidance of pride treating people equally and acceptance of arbitration and impartial judges so he's he's basically saying that once you uh, can establish this sovereign that it's good to promote things like gratitude and stuff like that because it promotes peace and that's a good thing so being gracious and and polite isn't good in itself for hobbes in in like the state of nature but once you've established the rule it's good to do these things because it creates a peaceful place that people can coexist we're bordering on establishing a rule and we're mentioning the word sovereign so much that it feels like we need to jump into part three and look at the solution to the state of nature we sure will we all will. <laughs> I would be pretty screwed in a state of nature. Thank God for the pan cast, the solution to all of our problems. Without the pan cast, life would certainly be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. Come to mention it, that episode was pretty short. I might have to hit up the Pansycast website and continue on my journey into political philosophy.